Hey, Can't hear you um, muted. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? How's the sound? Sounds good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. How are you? Yeah, we have already a few copiers waiting for you here. What is this room you're in? Is that just a background or is that like a new uh, studio? No, 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 just a background. <laughs> Looks funny. Yeah, for Itoro. All right. Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. So the agenda for this evening is that I'll talk a bit about my background and, um, and uh, a bit about myself and then about my investment strategy and how I see the markets, then uh, talk about my plan for the future and how I've uh, currently placed my money. And then at the end, there'll be opportunities for questions. So the reason many of you are here is that since 2013, I've delivered over 32% average annual return on eToro and with quite a high stability as well. So I think it's fair to say that's better than most other investors you could fairly compare with. If you wanted a better um, return to risk profile, you should have invested with Ray Dalio, but you'd have had a lot lower overall return. And if you wanted a higher return, you would have probably have had to accept a lot higher volatility, for instance, investing only in Amazon or something like that. I started my career out um, as a management consultant advising banks and tech companies and others, and especially on valuation. So calculating how much is a company really worth. That's important if you want to make the right investments for a big company or you want to acquire another company and for many other reasons. And then I started investing for myself because I had some extra money from my consulting work. And at the time, the my bank and my pension fund, when I looked at what they were offering me in terms of investments, I thought, okay, I can definitely do better than that in terms of expected average return and risk profile. Like my pension fund was investing only in large Danish companies, which I thought, okay, that's like pretty risky. And I didn't expect that would give the highest return. So I started just investing for myself and then that continued to go really well. Then more people started copying me on eToro. And today I focus 100% on managing my investments. Um, I don't do everything on my own. I have a good network of experts that I rely on, especially on complex topics. So for instance, many years ago when I invested in some genetic stocks, it was very helpful that I had a friend who was doing his PhD in genetics at Oxford University. And so he could sort of help me say like, yeah, but what you're not understanding is this, and, you know, uh, you need to think about this in this way instead, which, you know, can help me get insights on some things a lot faster than if I myself try to read up on everything. And essentially for anything that I invest in, I need to either myself be an expert or I need to know someone who is. I also get a lot of strong support from eToro. Whenever I have a question or concern, eToro is very quick to respond. I pay a lot of money um, to subscribe to get the best data and also have the best IT tools. I have an assistant that helps me with all the stuff that's not the most difficult, but still very important. And then I think the two people that I rely on the most are my two little brothers. One of them, he works with AI for a large tech company. The other one is an economist in the Ministry of Finance. So anything with AI economics, that's uh, who I go to. Now, my investment strategy is based on some principles and these principles have been in place all along and they'll continue to be in place. What I invest in at different times is different, but it's always based on these same principles. So firstly, I look at macroeconomics, identifying what growth rates I expect different segments of capital markets will have, what regulations and policies will impact this, and what special events I need to um, you know, build a framework around, whether that's Brexit or US-China trade talks or the upcoming US election or whatever it is. I look for megatrends. That's trends that can grow by more than 10% per year for at least a decade, or at least that I evaluate should likely be able to do that. Then I focus on fundamentals, conducting due diligence. So that means analyzing companies to really get a good understanding of the company. That's in terms of what's it like to be an employee there? What are the cash flows like? How have the financial statements been over the past years? What's the competition like? What's the management like? You know, really try to, to, to see them from every angle possible to get the, the best input for conducting my valuation. And then I conduct valuations using the DCF valuation method and multiples to calculate what's this company really worth. And then I compare that to the price. So I wanna buy companies that I think are very valuable, but are trading at a low price. Now there's a great quote by Benjamin Graham, the sort of mentor of Warren Buffett. He said that in the short term, the market is a voting machine, but in the long term, a weighing machine. And that essentially means that, you know, when I analyze a company and I think I found a really amazing company that's trading at a low price, I invest in it based on the idea that I'm making a good deal right now. 
but I'm making that deal because other people are wrong. Other people are wrongly valuing this company. And if they are wrong today, I also think they're going to be wrong next month. I also think they're going to be wrong next year. It's not that, you know, I'm right now and one month from now, everybody's going to know everything that I know and it's all going to, you know, come to the fair value. That's not what happens. So you have to be willing to hold out for the long term. Now, sometimes, you know, the reality hits you faster than you expected. For many, many years, I've been working from home and saying to everybody working from home is great. And then, you know, that everybody's going to work from home in the future. And I've invested based on that. And one of the reasons this year's had such high returns for me is that very reason that the whole work from home revolution I was anticipating just suddenly came a lot faster than expected. So, you know, sometimes you get a positive surprise like that. In terms of risk management, I'm generally invested in 40 to 50 different um, assets. I generally don't have more than 5% invested in a single asset, although it can happen sometimes, especially if an asset is uh, negatively correlated to the rest of my portfolio. So that means that it tends to go up when the risk goes down and vice versa. So having more of it actually reduces your risk. I'm also diversified well across geographies, industries, and business models. The last one's the most important one. Lots of other uh, asset funds are um, will diver uh, diversified across geographies and industries, but actually not across business models. So they might have many different businesses, but they don't realize that all of these are about to be annihilated by Amazon. Then I hedge against specific tail risks. So these are risks that are quite unlikely to materialize, but if they do happen, then they'll be very impactful. And so for these, I tend to have one or two investments that are particularly chosen to, you know, in, in, in the expectation that they'll do well if that small risk should materialize. I focus on keeping the fees low. So that means that I avoid shorting using leverage, high fee instruments. And my most traded asset is stocks, which has 0% commission on eToro. And when eToro changes the um, fee structure, I also slightly change how I invest. So that's just one more way that you can squeeze a bit more profitability out of your portfolio. Now, where do I then see some great opportunities? A thing that I really like is organic growth. That means companies that are selling more products or selling them at a higher price, but it doesn't mean companies that are growing through acquisitions. So quite often when you read an annual report, you'll see in the first few pages, it says, again, this year we increased revenue by 2%. Isn't it great? But then when you really analyze it, you think, yeah, that's because you acquired another company. You know, the core business actually shrunk by 3%. So it's not actually very impressive what you've done. I also like companies that are resilient, that have a future fit business model. And that I think, you know, especially when you have an event that could go one way or the other, like one zero, but it's, you know, 60% this go this way, 40% it goes that way. Then, you know, if you can pick a company that'll do well in one of the scenarios, that's fine. But if you can find some that'll do well in both scenarios, that's even better. I like companies that have high growth, especially if they can keep their, a large part of their costs fixed. Uh, because then the picture of the profitability can change a lot over a few years. So even if you are, have uh, you know, losses at the moment, if you just keep growing the revenue while keeping most of the cost base fixed, then you know, a few years down the line, it, it can just be completely different. I like companies that change their strategy, especially if they're going from a bad strategy to a good strategy, because often you can come in at the price of the bad strategy, but you'll, re you'll be rewarded with the value of the new good strategy. But it's not enough for me to have a company say they are changing their strategy. I need to see some you know, real bold action behind it so that I can trust that they're actually serious about it. So for instance, when Orsted sold off their oil and gas business and changed their name, that was like, okay, they are not just saying that they have a new strategy. They're really serious about this. And then that was the time that I invested in them. Then, you know, sometimes you don't have to predict the future. It's enough you just know what's sort of going on in the present. So when uh, Steve Barmer, the former CEO of Microsoft, he held the first iPhone in his hand. Um, he said, you know, oh, it doesn't have a keyboard. It's too expensive. Business customers won't like this. I'm very comfortable about our position. And he was, of course, proven wrong by the success of the iPhone. But that was a classic example of having the Blockbuster product in your hand and just not being able to see that this is the Blockbuster product. And that's also reason, uh, like uh, recently happened with Tesla. And if you're able to be a good uh, shopper, you know, just compare products and pick the best, best one and just know, like, why is this product better than this one? Then that's like one piece of the puzzle that you have solved. Then, of course, it's not everything. But if you get that part wrong, I think then you'll be in, in trouble with your investments. I really like companies that are mission driven. So that's especially because they can attract and keep great people without overpaying them. You have some companies that are just magnets for great people and others that are just, you know, bleeding good employees. And they're great ways you can find out what kind 
any company is. And that's something that you can also then see transition into the financial statements over a few years. Now I have an apartment that I rent out and I have my stock portfolio and many uh, of you here probably also have some property and your stocks. And that's very sensible because historically that's been the best uh, asset classes to invest in. Bonds have not been so great. Commodities, depending on the time horizon has not been very good and currencies have been quite terrible. So whenever I have a lot of cash, I try to transition it to the left in this chart and you know, ideally invested in some stocks. Then if we look at what really drives economic growth, I like to dissect it into the social and political and the technology and process based. So the most important thing for growth is trust. If we trust each other, we can make agreements with each other and that can enable the projects and routines that, that you know, really create growth. If we look at um, stocks, bonds, deeds to a property, cash, all of these are just social constructs. If we believe in these, then they can be used to create a lot of value. But if our belief in these uh, dissipates, then that value can dissipate very quickly as well. And then you have some taste changes where it could be coming from a very small basis, something most people don't even notice. But if it's growing at a, at a, a high growth rate year by year, then suddenly it becomes something that you know uh, is impacting the whole economy and something that everybody suddenly talks about. And that can, of course, be very good to pick up on that early. Then in terms of technology and processes, Mother Nature sometimes throws us some curveballs. I used to have Ebola in this presentation. Now, of course, it's been changed to COVID-19. And um, demographic changes is a very important topic. You have some countries where a large segment are growing into the elderly population. And you have other countries where a large segment are going into the prime working age population. And the companies that are rightly positioned to target the right segment in the right country, they have a huge benefit. Then you have some mega projects being created here and there. It's not always that the mega projects themselves are great investments, but they often spawn other great investment opportunities. So for instance, when Inmarsat launches a large fleet of satellites, that may or may not be good for Inmarsat, but it's definitely good for the company that makes the satellite terminals that works with those satellites. Then there are some mega trends that I've uh, identified as extra interesting. And so if a company is riding or driving one of these megatrends, one or more of these megatrends, then it's more likely to be found in my portfolio. So in terms of digital transformation, I think that there's a global distribution engine being created in the world where the more people get deliveries at home, the more often companies can come to your home to make the delivery. The more often they do that, the more scale they get, the more scale, the cheaper they can do it, the cheaper they can do it, the more people will use it. And so the companies that are at the center of this virtuous circle, they will really profit massively. Then I think that um, the third world war has sort of already started and it's very different from you know, the second world war. In the second world war, it was a war of logistics and diplomacy and it was one with, uh, with, with tanks and airplanes and whatnot. But now if you wanna defend values such as democracy and uh, capitalism and whatnot, or, or fight against it for whatever reason, then it's a battle of ideas and arguments and information. And so militaries need to start hiring journalists rather than hiring soldiers. And the companies that have the products that are going to be key to win this war, they will profit massively and they are to be found in the portfolio. And then the companies that have made the biggest breakthroughs in AI and robotics over the last three years are also to be found in the portfolio. Some of them with very small investments, if I think it's a highly priced company, I would still be, you know, I would be scared to not be an investor in Google if they one day invent general AI. But there are some companies obviously that are amazing, have great potential in terms of AI and are also reasonably priced. And so those you will find in my portfolio at a much higher, you know, investment percentage. Then when you have an industry or a group of companies that you wanna uh, compare quickly, sort of to get an overview, a great way is to look at the multiples. So this is an example using FANG. So Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. And if we look in the top left corner, we can see that Facebook has had an amazing profit margin of 37%. And you know, Apple, Netflix, and Google have done very well as well, but Amazon is lagging a little bit behind here with only a 5% profit margin. If we look at the growth rate, again, Facebook has done amazingly. They've all done amazingly, but Apple is lagging a little bit behind. Now, the two top charts here, the higher, the better, because they're about profitability and growth. But the two um, bottom charts, the 
lower the bidder because they're about price. So if we look at the lower left corner, we can see that for every dollar of profit for Facebook, we have to pay $26 when we invest. So that's all right, especially given you know the amazing growth rate. But if we look at Amazon and Netflix, we are paying $100 and $62 for every dollar of profit. Now that's very high and we'd only want to pay that much if we believe they can sustain this growth rate or maybe improve the profit margin or something. Otherwise we'd say, wow, that's way too much to pay. And similarly, when we look at how much we're paying for every dollar of revenue, we can see we're paying $10 for every dollar of revenue for Facebook, but we're paying 11 for Netflix and we're only paying five for Amazon. But on the other hand, for Amazon, we're also getting a lot less profit margin out of that revenue. So this is sort of a quick way you can compare uh, companies on, on, and uh, sort of uh, get an overview of, of how they relate to each other. Now, beautiful charts like this is unfortunately not what I get to look at all day. What I look at you know, 90% of the time are big data tables like this. So these data tables uh, can uh, be created in many different ways. I have some that are automatically updated. I have some where I need to make some adjustments manually. And then there are some that are sort of unique uh, crafted data tables. My favorite one is uh, one that uh, I call uh, realistic scenarios, which is essentially all concepts and ideas from all science fiction in the world that I made the longest list. I believe my list is 10 times longer than the second biggest list in the world. And then, you know, evaluations on when these things could potentially materialize. But it could also just be something like I evaluate how uh, beautiful is their website, how good is their CEO on a scale from one to 10. And this is, so it's subjective, but it's numerical and it can be used in my valuation and risk models. Then um, those valuation and risk models inform me on either you know, a, a decision to make an investment or a decision that more research is needed. So there could be a stock that suddenly looks very interesting, but I also know that I need to do more research to really understand this company. Maybe this is a different kind of company and there are some new things that need to be taken into consideration. And this makes me then update my models and that makes me update my analysis and that makes me in the end come to the best investment decisions that, that I can. And um, an investment decision can either be to increase you know, an investment that I already have, or it could be to decrease, or it could be to sell something completely or you know, make very large changes in the portfolio at some points. And then, of course, those investment decisions lead me to the portfolio that I have today. So my portfolio is um, spread across many different industries, but there is a bias towards tech and media, green tech, finance, entertainment, and defense. If you look at um, the uh, American economy, you can also see that uh, it's not just one industry that's contributing all of the uh, economic activity in America. It's spread across many different industries as well. And within many different industries, there are great investment opportunities. And if you look, no single investment makes up more than 5% of my portfolio. The largest one is at like 4.5%. And so that's Nintendo, SolarEdge, Sliders, Amazon. And of course, you can always at any time see my entire portfolio and the percentages uh, on eToro. So that was my presentation. I hope you learned something and enjoyed it. If you have any questions, then now is a good time to ask. If you remember your question later, then you can always ask me on eToro or add me on LinkedIn or watch some of my YouTube videos or go to my website. I'm on eToro every day, including weekends and holidays. So if you ask on eToro, I usually respond within 24 hours. So let's have the first question. So I see here there's one. Do you recommend monthly or quarterly investment? So this is a trade-off, you know, ideally when you make investments, you'd almost want to do them on a continuous basis every second, but that's going to take a lot of time and effort and hassle. So I think in reality for most people, quarterly is a great compromise where you say, you know, if you do it once per year, you're probably, you know, you're probably leaving your cash idle for way too long. If you do it every month, if you have the time and you sort of enjoy the process, then that's very fine. And that will, you know, on average make you, uh, you know, more money so it, it is better to do it every month but it's simply a question of, of the of, of the hassle and time you need to at least invest three hundred dollars whenever you do it so for any sort of small investors that don't have three hundred dollars every month then they might have a hundred dollars every month or, and then it'll become three hundred dollars every quarter so yeah it uh, i think if you can do monthly that's better but if it's taking too much of your time do it quarterly then someone asked if i can say something about bitcoin i still think bitcoin is um a interesting in the sense that it's the in pole position to be uh, the leading global private currency. Unfortunately, it's built on blockchain, which is a technology that doesn't scale very well. And that there's, there's um, I think, 
I think now great mathematicians, I used to say, you know, you know, there are some issues and they can be solved, but I'm sort of losing hope because the great mathematicians that have been working on these things, they haven't come with the solutions. And, you know, there, there, there's not been like an increase in people working on it, but still Bitcoin can be very fine. And we can have Bitcoin in the future that's built off of a completely different transaction system than blockchain. So you could say, well, Bitcoin will remain on the blockchain, but actually the day-to-day -day transactions are on a, you know, a, a completely different network or something. And then we can still have a private currency with all of the benefits with, with some of the benefits. And as long as Bitcoin is in pole position to be that private currency, and as long as private currencies, I think in the long term, have a good chance of outcompeting uh, government controlled or central bank controlled currencies, then th that's something that I want to have at least a little bit invested in. Um, Palantir is, uh, you know, quite an amazing company. I think the question in everybody's mind with them is how, um, like, it, how, how scalable they are in, in terms of like how what how what percent of their cost base is really fixed. Whenever you have a a, a company that does some sort of a, a, a product that they sell, but there's also some consulting involved. If it's a lot of consulting involved, and the you know in order then if you double your uh, your revenue, you're probably also going to have to hire more consultants, which sucks. Then you know then you don't get this huge uptick in profit when you get the growth. But if you have more of a, a fixed software product and it's not too consultant then when you get the growth, all of that growth comes to your bottom line. And I think that, um, I think that Palantir is actually, um, I think it, it, it's mostly fixed. And so when they continue this amazing growth, then, then that will transition down to the bottom line and their profitability picture will look completely different a few years down the line. And then it, uh, yeah, then it's it's um I I would invest even more if my sort of like risk score would allow it. But it's it's a uh, you know it's considered a, a a volatile risky investment, and but it's one that I I really like. Um. Uh, so yeah. Uh, uh, around def defensive stocks. So someone asked me if I have a strategy around defensive stocks. I definitely do. I always look at which um, stocks that you know I want to have now, but there's also different stocks that are not interesting. I generally um, track around 150 different investments. So there are some, and I'm invested in 40 to 50 of them. So there are some stocks that I I I, I I'm very well aware of. I I you know I continue to follow what's going on with them. I look at their, their uh, financial metrics and whatnot with the pure purpose that if there are some changes in the economy that suddenly make these more attractive, then I want to be ready to invest right then and not have like a whole um, burden of research that needs to be done before I can make the investment. And that's including, that's, that's, that's where a lot of the defensive stocks lie. Now, there are some stocks that did well in the last crisis or did well in a, in a past downturn. And so everybody's aware of this. And because everybody's aware of this, it's already included in the price. So you won't get the same sort of um, defensive benefit by investing in those. So you need to find stocks that will do well in a downturn that others don't know will do well in a downturn before you can sort of get a, a good deal on them. The, the things that everybody knows about, like, oh, gold will do well if the market flips, then it's like, yeah. And for that reason, everybody's bid up gold and everybody's aware of gold. And then that you don't get the same deal that you did like, you know, 20 years ago. Um, then someone asked what I think about gold compared to silver. And I think... Um, Silver has two advantages. One is that there's more of a ceiling to the price because there's industrial use. So gold can hypothetically fall quite a bit, but silver can only fall a certain amount. So that's like a little safety valve you have there. And then if you just look since the you know the Roman Empire, what's been the, the rate of gold to silver, then you can see that silver is, 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 is quite cheap at the moment. And of course, maybe we are in an age where people think that the best is worth a lot more, like the, 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 the difference from, from medium to best is a lot higher, but I don't think it justifies this sort of like a, a, a difference in rate that we have today. Uh, I don't have an opinion on Motley Fool. I think uh, it's generally one that I have, have, well, I have an opinion, it's one that I avoid. There's lots of like a financial, uh, you know, there's lots of, of just websites that have quite poor quality financial uh, opinions and uh, yeah, I generally avoid those. Someone asked if they should copy open trades. I always recommend copying open trades whenever you uh, copy me or add funds, because that way you are investing in the same things that I've invested in. And when I then you know close something, then you do the same. When I invest in something new, you do the same. If you only invest in the new trades, then you'll get a very strange portfolio because just because something is a new, there's no like a correlation that the new trades are better than the old trades. It's like Amazon doesn't care how long I've hold, had my stock. It's like either Amazon today is a good investment or it's not a good investment. It's not like it dependent on, oh, did you invest a half year ago or a week ago? Amazon doesn't care about that. 
Um, for mid long term perspective, do you think that it's still interesting to invest in GAFAM with the current pricing? Uh, I don't have an uh, opinion on that. Uh, what, what if the market corrects or drops down significantly? So then it depends for me how the my valuation changes uh, in relation to the price. So if there is some very bad news that causes the market to decline in price by 20%, and my evaluation is that it's only dropped in value by 15%, that I'd be inclined to invest more. But if the market drops by 20% in price and I evaluate that you know its value has gone down by 25%, then I'd like to sell everything. But it doesn't matter like whether the price goes up or down by 20%. What matters is how the price changes in relation to the value. So it's it's not enough to just be um and similarly, you know, sometimes when the market goes up by 20%. But the value is increased by 20%. It's similar to if you went down to the supermarket to buy a Coca-Cola and you were like, oh, I'm going to buy one liter of cola for one dollar. And then you come down, then you're like, oh no, now it costs, you know, um, two dollars to buy two liters. You're like, you're basically getting the same deal. Yeah, the stocks are uh, priced higher, but you're also getting more value. Um, Someone says, adding additional funds to the ongoing copy opens duplicates of the current trade. So we end up having double the amount of open trades. How would Etern know which ones and how many to close when you close one on your side? So they'll all be related. So if, if I have um, one position and you've added funds three times and you have that position three times, when I close it, you close all three. If I cut it in half, you cut all, all three in half. So it's proportional. Uh, green stocks, preferably hydrogen. Um, I think that a lot of the... Um, a lot of the political will and capital that's coming in to green energy is um, whether or not uh, Biden wins the election, whether or not the European Union tries to do one thing or the other. I think this uh, th this capital is coming and it's 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 continuing to coming stronger. So that that's the big benefit. Then you just have to sort of look where in the value chain the value will be attributed. You've had cases in the past where you know you have a you have one industry that's really great, but actually all of the profits come to some of their suppliers. So you and, and here I think so you gotta understand what is the what is the bottleneck, what is the sort of key asset that is needed for uh, for a particular kind of energy to be produced. And if you if you then in, in, then if you can invest in that particular asset, then that's where the you'll get the highest profits. Uh, comments on nil, no. Oh, for the U.S. election. So, um, I, I some of you may know, but my my dad, he was a member of the European Parliament for 29 years, got elected eight times, and I myself work with them um, with elections as well. So I have quite a lot of sort of uh, views on, on on politics. It's one of my passions that I probably spend too much time on. And with the U.S. election, of course, I have my own model to estimate uh, who I think is going to win that I update every day. And I think if you look at how um, how how Trump was positioned last time, he got 306 electoral college votes. So to win, you need 270. So he can afford to lose 36 electoral college votes. Now, how can you lose 36? If you look at the states that voted Republican last time, you can, I've identified six of them that could flip. So these are the ones that are the most likely to change from Republican to Democrat. And from these ones, if you lose, um, if Trump loses Florida, that's like 29 electoral college votes he's going to lose right there. So then he can, then then if he loses that one plus any other state, then Biden wins. If uh, he, if Trump wins Florida, then he actually needs to lose three of the other battleground states. And so that's more difficult. That could be something like, you know, Minnesota, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, any other combination, but he still needs to lose like three out of five then if he loses Florida um, or if he wins Florida. So to add funds in the foreseeable future, I don't have any plan to do that. If I do um, plan to add funds at some point, then I'll let uh, everybody know on eToro uh, way in advance, likely uh, more than a month in advance. And in addition to um, letting people know that I'm doing it, I'll also provide my recommendations for what different types of copiers should do. So if you are a small copy or a big copy, or you, are, you want to add funds or you don't want to add funds, for any kind of hypothetical scenario you could be in, I'll provide you know some thoughts on, on what's, what's what, what to consider. Um, that, that's exactly how it was done last time I added funds and that, that's how I would do it again. Um, do you have the same portfolio outside eToro on your personal? So the only account that I trade on is my eToro account. Yeah. So uh, um, maybe you want to say a few words you have said to your little copy is here. Um, well, thank you everybody for uh, listening in. And if you uh, if you 
didn't get to ask a question or you remember it later, then again, uh, yeah, add me on eToro. So I hope everybody has a good evening and stay safe and, uh, and everything. And thank you, Tomo, very much for, uh, for hosting this. Thank you, Epe. Thank you, everyone, for participating, Johnny. Thank you, Epe. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.